two years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, migrants who have been refused asylum in the UK will be offered thousands of pounds to move to, you guessed it, Rwanda in a ludicrous new government scheme. Richard Sunak resists calls to hand back £10 million donated to the Tory party after the donor is called racist by Diane Abbott. The ministers are to quash hundreds of false convictions of fraud and theft for people whose lives were ruined by the post office scandal. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. It's Wednesday night, isn't it? How do we know? They've all been shouting and pointing at each other in the mother of all parliaments. It's also Ladies' Day at Cheltenham, but don't tell the wokists. And I'll bring you a sample of some of the strangest stories around. Freaky fashion, the surly Spanish, and some very odd goings-on at a funeral parlour in Hull. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Get your checkbooks out. You remember the Rwanda scheme? You know, the one the government spent £240 million failing to get off the ground for years. Well, now migrants who have their asylum claims rejected can still find themselves in Rwanda, but with a tasty cash incentive. Here to explain how this would work is Home Affairs editor at the Times, Matt Dathan. Matt, a very good evening to you. Um, the government surely can't think that this is a good idea, can they? Well, I think uh, this has been uh, drawn up since actually Suella Bravman and Robert Jenrick left government in December. Um, so it's been uh, agreed with the Rwandan government in the last few months th this year that we, we understand. Um, and it's, it's a, a, se a separate scheme to the uh, forced deportation scheme. Um, it's a voluntary scheme, so they've already actually started uh, asking and phoning up asylum seekers or failed asylum seekers whether they want to uh, take up the offer of £3,000 to be moved to Rwanda. I think essentially what this boils down to is a kind of contingency or black, uh, backup plan by the government. They've got this multi-million pound scheme in place, uh, which has cost them a lot of money, taxpayers' money, but also political capital. Uh, and they are at risk of uh, not using a single flight uh, to, uh, to Rwanda. So they want to make sure that they at least get some people over there to use the scheme before the election. And by offering them three grand uh, to do so, they, they hope that they will get at least a flight over uh, by the May election. Yeah, can any of us apply to go to Rwanda? Because, you know, this country is in such a terrible state. You know, I wouldn't mind being given three grand to go and live in Rwanda for a while because you could be sure that once you're there and you don't like it, you could just go, uh, excuse me, can I come back now because I don't like it? Well, I don't know if you're a failed asylum seeker, Mike, but uh, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> Sometimes not. Sometimes I wish I was. Stage, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it, does beg, it does beg a belief sometimes, this scheme, to be honest, um, because why would people who have paid thousands of pounds to come to the UK... Uh, in a very risky way across yeah. the, the channel in a small, flimsy dinghy, um, take up the offer of uh, just £3,000 to go to Rwanda, um, when they could just leave Rwanda, um, I guess, uh, you know, at 4,000 miles away. Why, why would they do that? Um, it doesn't really make any sense. No. The government have um, been exploring whether there might be some people who want to take up the offer. I mean, if I was a psychiatrist, I'd say the government has got a problem with the word Rwanda, and they've now become so fixated by it that they'll do almost anything to tell somebody at some point or other, told you we'd get some people to Rwanda? Well, it, it, it comes down to that, the politics of it. Rishi Sunak does not want to be standing at the election uh, with the accusation that he hasn't uh, sent a single migrant to Rwanda, despite spending £350 million on the scheme. Um, uh, but it's become tot totemic of the whole government's uh, handling of immigration, both legal and illegal, mm. to be honest, the word Rwanda. Uh, this scheme is actually quite novel, though, because although the government have voluntary schemes to return uh, failed asylum seekers and foreign criminals to their home country, they don't actually have a, a third country destination. Uh, and this 
the, the Home Office do point out that this could, if it worked, provide a, blue, a blueprint, really, for a lot of the failed asylum seekers who are stuck in limbo. A lot of Afghans, Iranians, for example, who have failed to claim asylum in the UK uh, cannot be returned to their home countries for the obvious reasons that the, the, the Taliban are in control and, 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 and the Iranian uh, authoritarian regime would um, persecute them. So they're stuck here in limbo, having failed on the asylum claim, but nowhere to, to go. So maybe by um, offering them a chance to go to a third country like Rwanda, uh, that could solve the problem. Well, it could, maybe, in theory, very possibly, but, you know, we've been getting to do this for a while. That somehow, I'm not really convinced yet. But uh, you broke the story, Matt, last uh, night in The Times. Uh, have you got something for us tonight uh, to see whether anything is actually going to move that's going to convince anyone that Rishi Sunak will get this to happen? Well, we're reporting tonight that, um, as I've just mentioned, actually, um, as I broke it to you first, actually, before The Times website, um, that uh, the man. Home Office has already started... Uh, phoning asylum seekers. In fact, in the last week, they've phoned, um, I, I know of an asylum seeker in London and an asylum seeker in York, uh, Yorkshire, that have been contacted uh, in the last week by the Home Office, offering them three grand, told to reply as soon as possible because they might, they might lose the opportunity uh, to, be, to be sent to Rwanda. Um, and they, if, if, they're, if they manage to get a group of asylum seekers who are willing to take up the offer, um, the... The, those individuals will be sent to Kigali, we understand, on commercial flights, and they could happen within the next month uh, because it, it doesn't require, you know, all the legal loopholes that they'll have to go through uh, through the forced deportation. They don't need to be detained. They don't need to be forced onto flights. They can go on commercial flights that fly to Rwanda uh, three or four times a week now with Rwanda Air, for example, um, and go there through their own free will. Right. It's an extraordinary story. Matt, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for coming on to talk to us. Matt Dathan there from The Times uh, with that breaking news, incredible exclusive, which The Times will have in full later on tonight, but we're bringing you first, is that um, basically we're now ringing up people whose phones we've no doubt supplied to them, uh, illegal migrants who may or may not have failed to get in uh, the legal route for asylum. Uh, so we're now asking them if they'd like to go abroad for a little holiday and be paid £3,000. Joining me now, former UKIP leader and border expert, Henry Bolton. Henry, I mean, it just goes from the ridiculous to the absolutely and utterly incredulous, doesn't it? Uh, so we're now, the Home Office is now actually operating as a travel agent, ringing people up whose numbers they have, mm -hmm. who are illegal asylum seekers, illegal migrants who probably have been given those phones, to ask them if they'd like to have £3,000 to go to another country. Uh, it, it, it beggars belief. Look, Rwanda, I've always said, was never going to deliver what the Prime Minister mm. said. It's not going to stop the f small boats. Even if everything about it, all the legislation and everything else went mm. swimmingly well, yeah. it would not be a deterrent to crossing the channel. Right. And, just by the government's own figures, we'd be looking at maybe one in 80, even if it all, all went swimmingly yeah. well, one in 80 people crossing the channel and claiming asylum would end up being sent to Rwanda. That's no deterrent. We're going after the wrong people. We should be going after... The... You want a deterrent? Deter the people smugglers. Right. Carry the risk to the people smugglers, and then you might have an effect. But first of all, it's an inc inconceived and badly executed plan. Yeah. Secondly, part of that is... Well, there's a whole load of badly executed it, plans it, now. It is. There's it more is. than one. But, but what we've got then is the Prime Minister knows, unless he is far more stupid than even I think he is, that the legislation that's going through at the moment, um, and they're, they're now looking at, the, I think the next reading is on the 18th of March right. of the Rwanda Safety Bill um, and the amendments that came out of the Lords. But he knows, the government knows perfectly well that that is incredibly weak mm. legislation. Mm. He knows that there is the appeals process is still there that anybody he tries to force or the Home Office tries to force to go to Rwanda and they don't want to, then they'll have the same debacle that they've had in numerous other occasions that there will be a last-minute appeal and these people will... It, the whole thing will be disrupted. His only hope, as Matt quite rightly points out, his only hope of getting flights to Rwanda this year is to get volunteers to go. Yes. And he's trying to put a carrot out there which is the three grand. Right. Now, it is... Which, by the way, can I just remind everybody, in case you're confused, is, is our money. It uh, is. That's our money. money. So, Absolutely. So, he wants to, uh, so you add it to everything else that these people are costing. Yeah. It's 5.4 billion a year. Yeah. Now, three grand... I mean, it's about another 120 million if you send 40,000 yeah. people over there, which is the number that come across the channel. I mean, it, so... Well, he, he's not going to do that. But say he even gets 200 people on a plane, yeah. that's 600,000 quid. It is. Of Absolutely. my money. 
Absolutely. And your money. So, and everybody so else's money. It, it, it's, it's a bloody the joke. The whole thing's shocking. And all it is is smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Bad plan, badly drafted yeah. legislation to make it happen. And so the, the, the shop window piece that he will claim, you know, oh, we've got flights going. After all yeah. this criticism and all this bad press, yeah. all of this, these naysayers, we've got flights going to Rwanda. Yes, because you paid, paid each person yeah. on there three grand to go. Maybe we um, should get them flights to the Euros because then perhaps well, they'd, they'd land somewhere like <laughs> Germany, right, watch a few football <laughs> matches and maybe prefer Germany to stay there for a while. Yeah, well, then know. we exclude them because they're football hooligans. Yeah, well, there you go. Then <laughs> you can certainly arrest them and <laughs> but, lock them up. But we shouldn't let these people in in the first place. No. There's, there, are, there is a raft of agreements, not law, but agreements that... Imp, that bed not in just the a principle raft. That we, that a punch... dirigible of them. There is, you know. <laughs> the whole thing's dirigible. Yeah, the whole thing is dirigible. <laughs> but the other, the other thing, right, is that, you know what the, the people traffickers will now be saying, and here's another incentive to come to Britain, yeah. because they're now going to pay you to leave. Yeah, even, even right? if you're not successful, you yeah. get three grand to go to Rwanda. Yeah, but even if you don't care... Then that's more business yeah. for the people. But if I'm we'll, sitting we'll in some camp in Calais, I'll go, yeah. I quite fancy uh, 3,000 quid, so I'll go, yeah. to, uh, I'll go to Dover, uh, I'll pretend I want to claim asylum, they'll give me three grand, I'll go to Rwanda, and I'll hang out there for a while. But, you know, it's it, 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 just for people's information, this scheme already exists. If you're an asylum seeker and you decide you want to go home, right. you don't have to pay your own way. The British government will give you three grand to go. So it's an right. extension. What's happened is somewhere there's been a, a, a conversation. The Prime Minister has suddenly woken up mm. about bloody time. It's funny when elections so that, do that, wouldn't it? I know, yeah. yeah. And, and he said, well, look, are we going to get this through? Well, it's going to be a problem, Prime Minister, with that legislation. Well, how do we get this flight in the air? All he's worried about is the optics. Yes. There is the, the bottom line of this, which should be to manage immigration mm. and limit it, is, is being forgotten in this right. entire government. He literally, as I said to Matt, wants to stand up at some point or other behind a lectern, whether it's a Tory party conference, whether it's before a crowd of, you know, not so adoring fans, to say, I told you we'd send people to Rwanda. Yeah, exactly. And literally, if it's more than three, he'll call it people. Yeah. But it's not going to happen. Yeah. It, well, it, it may do now because he's paying them three grand yeah. to go. I mean, interesting um, to know we, what we the old... But we must not uh, let him off the hook. No, if that happens... Don't worry. We've got to remind everybody that all of these people were volunteers because they were paid on. to go back. What happens, though, if some bozo from the Human Rights Department goes, oh, you can't send him to Rwanda because it's dangerous? And the guy goes, yeah, no, but I've paid £3,000 to go. I actually want to well, go. Well, I, I what want, happens then? Yeah, but, but, Mike, I think the thing is that this gets them around all the legislation because the individual has said, oh, I'm, I'm happy to go. Yeah, I'm yeah. not appealing it. I'm not taking a legal process because you've just right. given me three grand in my bank account. Thank you very much. Right. Bank account is probably... Which presumably anyway. would then make the argument more, uh, more sort of solid for you to say as the government, well, these people are all volunteering to go, so yeah. they must be safe. Yeah, it, well, it, they wouldn't indeed. Volunteer so this otherwise. is all optics. It's all theatre. None of this, none of this, and this is the bottom line, is going to have any impact whatsoever on the immigration situation that this country faces. And that's the problem mm. here. The government is not dealing with the problem. The government is dealing with the optics to make it look as though it's going to do something, and it thinks that the electorate is stupid enough to take it on board. But I'm afraid the electorate video is over. not that stupid and not going to fall No, in, indeed, and that's why the, the Conservatives are polling us so abysmally. Yeah, moment. absolutely right. Maybe we should send all of them to Rwanda for 3,000 a time. How well, many people in the Cabinet? I'll get them somebody to do the maths on it in a little while. Henry, thank you very much indeed. Want... Henry Bolton there, uh, former member of UKIP, uh, leader of UKIP, I should say, and border expert, of course. Coming up, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Some justice, perhaps, tonight for hundreds of post office scandal victims. But what about the hundreds more that don't qualify? We'll discuss that with someone who has had his life destroyed by the scandal. And, of course, Paul Scully MP is with us as well. It's all coming next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite oh, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. Yeah. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Hundreds of sub-postmasters wrongfully convicted as part of the Horizon IT scandal are finally set to have their names cleared. The government's introduced a new bill that is set to exonerate the majority of victims in England and Wales prosecuted between 1996 and 2018. But some of those affected say they are still to be convinced that progress will be made and critics are disappointed the legislation does not apply to Scotland. So is this really what justice looks like? Joining me now is Paul Scully, Conservative MP uh, and former Postal Affairs Minister and sub-postmaster and victim of the scandal, Christopher Head. Uh, very good evening to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Christopher, you were one good of the youngest you. people affected by this horrible situation and, and you were uh, convicted in one way, shape or form, I believe. Um, is this going to affect you or, or if it's not going to affect you, what's your situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, I wasn't actually convicted. I went to a criminal investigation for six months, um, you know, twice interviewed under caution in my home search. Um, so I wasn't actually convicted. Then I went through a civil proceedings uh, with the post office. Right. Um, but obviously I've campaigned for a long time, on, obviously, on this uh, issue. And it's important that, you know, we got these uh, this legislation forward in order to begin the process of uh, overturning these convictions that have been outstanding for some people for more than two decades. And right so that they can obviously eventually access the compensation that they rightly deserve. Yeah, because, I mean, we've all spoken on Talk TV to various different colleagues, former colleagues of yours, who still have not received any kind of compensation whatsoever. We know some of them did receive compensation, but a lot of it was taken away by the lawyers. I mean, are most of the people affected by this then people who were actually convicted? Yeah, I mean, I said well, once the once the uh, convictions are actually overturned, uh, they can access uh, you know certain levels of compensation in terms of uh, in, interim payment of one hundred and sixty three thousand, and then they can either take six six hundred thousand pound and and walk away, or they can put a fully detailed assessment forward. Um, the, the problem is, as, as you know, what what people have actually been through in terms of you know losing their homes, their businesses, some of them you know their their family members. Um, and all the reputational damage. Sometimes, you know, the six hundred thousand pound will not go far enough for them people, and they need to go through a much more complex route to prove what their losses actually were. You know, so it, it's it's not a, a quick and easy process. No, of course not. Paul Scully, let me come to you. I mean, um, as you heard there uh, from Christopher, it's it's a welcome uh, move in the mm -hmm. right direction, but it's a very messy business, this, isn't it? It's going to take a very long time to get to all of the people who have been affected in so many different ways. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've been uh, either tweeting Christopher. We met the other day for the first time in person. He's been amazing at not just though, uh, trying to tackle his own situation, but campaigning for so many others and helping them through that process because it has been quite complicated for them in terms of the application forms they've had to fill in and these kind of things. And that's part of the uh, what's the word sort of due process that uh, um, that government has to do, I suppose, in some ways when it's spending taxpayers' money. Whereas clearly, as we can see with what's been what's playing out in front of us actually what christopher and other people need is life-changing money in a hurry to actually bring their lives back to some sort right. of normality for the people that are convicted whereas we can tackle the people that have just lost out financially i say just in inverted commas the, the uh, we can tackle the, the 555 that lost out because so much of their compensation went to the lawyers, the 555, they're the people that went into the group litigation order, the every court case that was in that drama series. But what we aren't able to do yet is compensate the people with live convictions because you're not allowed to um, com compensate convicted criminals as they still are seen in the eyes of the law. That's why we've got to get this legis legislation through so we can get them money as soon as possible too. Yes, and life-changing money is, is absolutely what they do require. However, Paul, I would ask you this, who's paying for that? Because there are people in this country who think it shouldn't be the taxpayer, it should perhaps be um, the people that put the systems in the first place and the people who continually victimise those who had done nothing wrong uh, but were being told that they were cheats and liars and thieves. Yeah, absolutely. Look, clearly the taxpayer has to underwrite it, so we all have to underwrite it to make sure that we can get the money out of the door, but it can't be left at that, as you rightly say. Uh, and I think someone, Duncan Baker, my colleague, uh, the North Norfolk MP, asked in the chamber today, the current Postal Affairs Minister here in Hollenrake, exactly that question. What's going to happen with Fujitsu, for example, who provided the Horizon um, uh, uh, software and said that it's absolutely impenetrable, there is no back door. So they're on the hook for this. They, but they've acknowledged the fact uh, that they have played a massive part in that. Uh, clearly... You know, the post office, the problem with the post office, it is publicly owned. And what we want to do is whatever you think about the reputation of the post office, it still has more bra branches than banks and building societies put together. And it still offers a massive service to people around this country. So we've got to give it a future as well. So, yes, taxpayers are underwriting it, but we've got to go further and make sure that those people who are responsible for it do end up paying. Yeah, good. Christopher, let me just come back to you. In your case then, when you were prosecuted through the civil process, the civil courts, what does that mean for you? How has that affected your life and how can you get rid of that sort of, you know, um, alleged shame, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, when it was ongoing for a long period, like I said that the criminal investigation lasted six months, which they dropped without any reason, and then they went down the civil route. And that was in a, was in a locked in battle that lasted almost two and a half years. Um, and it only became to an end um, because the group lit litigation order um, was granted and they, they agreed to put things on a stay. And it was only formally dropped in 2020. So it, it went on for almost five years hanging over my head, um, which just meant that you couldn't move on from anything. Like you know, I've explained to when I went into mediation just over a week ago, I was explaining to the lawyers there, saying, you know, even when you were going for jobs afterwards, you had two options. You either had to tell them why your contract ended with the post office, which, you know, if you turn around and say, well, it was, it was terminated because of contract uh, for, uh, theft and fraud allegations, then obviously they're not going to give you a job. And if you then don't tell the truth to them and they find out, oh, well, you've, you know, you've withheld that phone and that doesn't go down very well either. So you, you're kind of trapped um, and you, you just haven't been able to rebuild. You know, you, you couldn't get any type of work. I, I moved abroad for a, a period of time in order to try and mitigate my losses in, in, into a, a lowly paid job abroad. And, and then when I returned back to the UK again, I struggled again for that same problem with either yeah. gaps on my CV or trying to explain why that original contract came to a close. Right. So it's, you know, it's had a, a never-ending uh, problem with my life and also it's affected my family as well because you know, they, they were so subject to um, you know, small talk and gossip in, in the local area that we lived in all our lives, so it's, it's impacted all of us. Yes. And one of the things we don't hear about much from, 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 the, from the victims in this case is it must have affected things like your credit rating, which makes it, in this day and age, almost impossible to do anything. Yeah, I mean, every part of it, so whether it's your reputation, whether it's losing your business, whether it's losing your future career and all of them things, like you say, you have all of these smaller add-on things that really people don't talk about. I mean, especially anybody that has been declared bankrupt through it, whether that's directly caused by the post office or as an indirect effect of the post office. Um, all of these things need put right because, you know, you, you can give them compensation, but 
it, it, if they don't, if their credit rating isn't also restored along with it, then you know, like you say, there's not a lot they can do mm -hmm. with it. You know, they, they wouldn't be able to go out there and, and buy a house or get a mortgage or, or anything like that, even with the, the compensation right. that they have. So there's so many little aspects of this that need to be put up right, and that's why this becomes so complicated with so many different schemes, so many people affected in many different ways, and then you said all of these add-on things as well. Exactly right. Paul, I mean, um, Christopher makes a good point there, doesn't he? Because credit rating, I know it might sound trivial compared to all the other things that happen to these people, but, you know, anyone who's had problems with their own credit knows it's a real nightmare. You can't do anything. You can't get a credit card. You can't get a bank account. You can't get a mortgage. You can't buy a car. You can't lease a car. You can't rent a car. You can't do anything. So, I mean, there has to be presumably similarly backup, not necessarily legislation, but, but clear orders that, that all of these people must be restored to sort of full... British citizenship, if you like. Absolutely. Look, when I use the word compensation, I'm sort of using it in shorthand because actually what these people need, Christopher and the others need, is some sense of restoration. It's bringing them back, as you say, as close to where they would have been. Yeah. It's never going to be perfect. You're not going to be able to do that in reality. That's why I keep talking about life-changing money because that's the biggest lever that we have, the biggest uh, uh, ability to control this through Treasury. But you're absolutely right. It is these seemingly small things to us that, have, that all rack up to uh, make their lives so much more complicated. So the more we can do around that, uh, we can't do it soon enough, frankly. No, exactly right. Um, Paul Scully, thank you very much indeed. And Christopher, uh, good luck with it. Um, we'll keep in touch, I'm sure. We'll talk to you again. Christopher yeah, Head, um, again, still, still trying to get something out of the government, which, as I say, should not be us that's paying it. We'll find out more about that as we go forward. But at least a step in the right direction, it would appear, for so many of the victims whose lives were completely ruined and completely are still being ruined um, just for the sake of some computer company and Fujitsu who got it massively, massively wrong. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, more ruckus for Rishi as he navigates his sinking ship through another row. Choppy seas indeed. Stick to your seats. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. The world's biggest albatross has just been placed around the neck of the Tory party. The scandal of their donors' remarks, which the Prime Minister has finally called racist after sending junior ministers out to say they weren't, has sunk to a new level. Inside sources have told the papers this is the last straw for Sunak and the no-confidence letters are starting to tumble in through Sir Graham Brady's letterbox. Is this the end for Sunak's wet-fused premiership? Here's what Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer had to say. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the Chancellor, £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration and everybody else is paying the price. But yeah. two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Yeah. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 <laughs> all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election yeah. when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party yeah. is by voting Labour? Well, um, he wants people to vote Labour. He would ask them to do anything. Funnily enough, tonight, uh, the Labour Party actually put out a fundraising cry to all of their members using this £10 million pound donor um, as, a, as an excuse, but there we are. Joining me now, uh, we've got the panel here. Uh, Telegraph columnist Madeline Grant is here as well. Uh, we'll come to you guys in a moment. Madeline, um, you were probably in the Prime Minister's uh, room this, this, this afternoon when Prime Minister's questions were going on. It got a bit vitriolic, um, all sorts of accusations flying backwards and forwards. It's now getting to the point where, you know, racism, Islamophobia, as we were saying last night, is now the order of the day, um, instead of all of the things that actually are really wrong with the country. Yes, it does increasingly feel like PMQs is 35 minutes of every week where it basically consists of the two main parties pointing at each other and saying, no, your party is racist. No, your party is racist. And that's not to excuse the you know outrageous racist remarks made by the Tory donor or any of the other scandals that have erupted over the last few weeks, but it feels like we're always in mudslinging mode and the issues of real substance facing the country, these are just too difficult to discuss. So we go back to the mudslinging. Yeah. And I mean, perhaps towards ever thus, but certainly it feels like this is the new order of the day at PMQs more than um, in any time that I've been sketching it, certainly. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I mean, Star Wars spent a long time having a go um, at Rishi Sunak. Let's see what Rishi Sunak had to say. Finally, back to him. I think we've got that. Have we got that? Go on. The alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the man bankroll and the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? And here's what Rishi Sunak had to say back to him. Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr Speaker. 
his shadow, his shadow, fo his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing Conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make Chancellor, the man that he wanted to make Chancellor, talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. It's all rather unedifying, really, isn't it, Madeline? It's not what we expect from them. Well, I mean, I, I watch it every week, so I have come to expect it. But <laughs> um, yes, I, I none of that, none of these, none of the prime minister's defences there really work because it's such familiar stuff. Every single week, he falls back on these same defences. Um, you know, you you tried to make Corbyn prime minister, etc. And it's not that there isn't some truth to all of that, but. I think in response to, I think he would have actually been better off acknowledging um, the point that Keir Stum was making and maybe saying, you know, we're sorry that on behalf of him or, or something. But, you know, it's just, it's very difficult to win in these situations, mm. I suppose. But it does beg the question of, you know, at what point is it possible for someone to say a really outrageous thing in the public sphere and have some kind of future, you know, not being utterly cancelled from, right. from, from public life? Well, that you know, is it possible? That that is an important Sorry, point but... because, you know, people who have been absolutely banging the drum and saying that this guy is the worst human being that ever walked the earth, say he's a public figure, he wasn't, say that he said it in public, he didn't. You know, I'm not in any way condoning what he said, but he said it in a private meeting uh, and nobody's ever heard of him until this week. So, you know, it's not as if it's somebody like uh, David Lammy saying it or it's not as if it's somebody like Diane Abbott saying it and it's not as if it's somebody like Jeremy Hunt saying it. That would be different. So... As I say, nobody wins in this because they all speak. The only thing that I thought was interesting as well was Diane Abbott, as we saw in some of those clips, was wanting to be called to speak. But of course, under the new rules of the House of Commons, the Speaker doesn't want anybody to say anything controversial, so they didn't call her. Yeah, and I wonder if, um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what was going through the Speaker's head there, but I, I almost wonder if it, they might have some kind of reluctance to call people who have themselves lost the whip. Um, you know, Lee Anderson has lost the whip. Um, or had lost the whip until he joined the Reform Party. Diane Abbott was had lost the whip some time ago for, ironically, having downplayed another form of racism, anti-Semitism. Right. So I don't know if maybe there is some kind of, you know, policy of not choosing those independent MPs. I'd, I don't know. It's it's clearly enraged a lot of MPs that the Speaker did that and failed to call, call her up. And actually, um, obviously, a few weeks ago, um, the Speaker got into huge trouble because of his break with protocol. Mm. So there's now quite a sizable chunk of MPs who are angry with him for many different reasons. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me at all. Madeline, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's continue this with the panel. Uh, the Henry Jackson Society's Megan Gittos, editor of Spikes Online, Tom Slater, and Talk TV's estimable contributor, Esther Kreku. Welcome to all of you. I mean, I suppose in, in context, um, it now means that the House of Commons, like the rest of the country, doesn't work properly either because they don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't call the person that is at the centre of all of this to speak. Um, and all they do is slag each other off for being racist. It's a joke, isn't it? Yeah, I actually think she should have been called to no, speak. The whole session was should. about her. Yeah. So of course she should have been called right. to speak. How can you say, well, of course, it might have been controversial or she doesn't have the whip or, you know, we don't want to cause any trouble. She's still Ridiculous. an elected member and the conversation yeah. was about her. Of course she should have been called it was to yeah. speak. It was incredibly condescending, but I think it's because she, she might be a bit unhinged because yes. she asked... Allegedly, uh, Keir Starmer for the whip back, and he was like, "I understand." He's like, right. "Okay, can I have the whip back?" But I understand. Yeah. And I'm sure in his head he was thinking, "Hold on, why would I give you the whip back as a sort of a consolation prize because some guy yes. five years ago said he thinks you should be shot?" Right. Particularly I mean, under the circumstances. I mean, they've given Andy McDonald the whip back, I think, today, mm -hmm. um, who actually probably shouldn't have had it taken off him because even though he used the phrase "from the river to the sea," mm -hmm. he actually had the sentence that ended with for both Israelis and Palestinians. So, I mean, you know, that's a, maybe a slightly different thing, Tom. But, mm -hmm. but it is kind of um, a, kind of abominable and slightly shameful that this is the best we can turn up with on a Prime Minister's questions on a Wednesday. No, I think that's right. And I was really struck by it watching it today, where you've got all of these problems in society. You've got the economy being in the state that it's in. You've got the world being in the state that it's in. And we've just got both sides of the House mm. of Commons accusing each other of being racist. Yeah. It's not to say, as we've been talking about, that these issues are unimportant, no. that what Diane Abbott said was unimportant, that what this Tory donor idiot said was right. unimportant. It's just the fact that the, the fact that politics have been reduced to this yeah. for the whole week now. Well, I mean, and also, it, it is unimportant. Like, let's, let's call a spade a spade. In the grand scheme of things, this is very unimportant. Mm. People are not going to be talking about this a few weeks before the election, which might be right now, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the point. We know that this is wrong. We know that the Tories completely botched their response, trying to say, oh, it's a little bit racist, but it's not really racist. OK, fine, we get that. Right. But 
people have real concerns in this country. And it's so discouraging to see that the, both, both major parties just do not get it. The right. disconnect from the public. It's like, do you live in the same country right. as the rest of us? But also, it's almost like they're forcing everybody else to talk about racism. When, I mean, I don't think about racism every single day of the week. I don't think about it really at all. And it's rather ironic to me that having watched Prime Minister's questions for probably more decades than I care to remember, there are very many fewer white faces there now than there used to be. It used yeah. to be a completely white chamber. It's not now. So why are they all shouting racism all the time? Well, I think in a way, and you were getting into it with Madeleine Grant there, about how it's become a bit of a kind of displacement activity. I mean, the Tory party, what does it have to discuss? I mean, if Rishi Sunak was riding high in the polls or comfortable with yeah. the polls even, this story would have come and gone quite quickly, I imagine. But because of the fact that the Tory party under Rishi Sunak is a kind of dead man walking, yes. things like this can easily take up the whole news agenda. And then you've got... Labor, the Labour Party, who don't really want to say anything other than to try and catch out the Tories on anything they can. So we've yes. just got this really asinine debate all the time. This is just the latest iteration of it. Yeah, I mean, Harry Cole said today that he's he's calling this one of the darkest lows of uh, the, the Parliament that we've had in the past 14 years, including the actually, sort of dark days of Theresa May. Yeah, I actually said this to a friend a couple of weeks ago that because she said she kind of likes the historic quips that would be Prime Minister's questions. Yes. But it's 30 minutes of these quips that they think are funny boy debates, yeah, yeah and it's boring like i watched prime minister i can't watch it anymore it said not as you say they're not talking about things that matter no they're completely they and it's disconnected not funny and it's quite it's nasty not funny now. and it's quite nasty. It's getting nasty neither of them are any of life's great what? showmen no, either no, <laughs> they I haven't even got that it's just a on. glimpse to what politics will be so long as this crop of this generation of politicians mm. continues to stay in power because if any of them had a big vision a big compelling vision for britain they would be shouting it from the roof Mm -hmm. But to see that week in, week out, this is the quality and the standard of the debate that we get, we actually know that Britain is heading into darker times. Yeah. Because this is probably going to be the, the status quo for the next few years, mm -hmm. no matter who's elected. Right. And how about this, right? This actually comes from inside the Tory party, again from Harry Cole. Some people are saying seven months is a long time in politics. Just imagine what would happen if England won the Euros, <laughs> Team GB had a hat full of gold at the Olympics. <laughs> the landscape could be very different. I mean, do they really think people are that stupid? <laughs> but, well, yeah. You know, we won the Euros, let's vote Tory. <laughs> to be honest, I, like, look, it's a really stupid thing to say, but it, it, there's some truth in it. There is. We know that about polls. There is. Give, give people a nice summer, like the summer of 2020, really hot with the Euros. There is some Lots of England in that. flags. Like, we did go... The Labour Party yeah. do feel uncomfortable with England flags. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There yeah. is some like, truth well, in it. Yeah. Because it's not... The, the mood right now in the country, as you say, it's dire. It's, it's dire. dire. And it's reflective in, in that what is looks like a cesspit. And this is what happens when you govern based on Twitter. You start right. acting yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you... we were talking at the top of the show about this latest manoeuvre, um, which now has been followed up. £3,000, uh, I bid you, to pay for somebody to go to Rwanda. Um, then now, the exclusive we're going to tell you about tonight from The Times is that the government's now actually ringing people up, individual asylum seekers, and asking them if they'd like to go to Rwanda for 3000 quid. I mean, that's what it's come down to. The Home Office literally acted like a travel agent. So, I mean, some of these people don't make 3,000 quid a year in the no. place that they came from. And I think the government is just using this as a way to mask figures because if they can say, we got people to Rwanda, yeah, not say totally. whether voluntarily or not, it looks like actually they, the, 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 the plane went off. They actually mm -hmm. got people there. Yeah. But they're not talking about the fact that in many cases they don't know where these people are actually coming from. Many of them destroy no. the documentation before they come in. They have a good chance of staying anyway because mm. the vast majority of them end up staying. They can, they can rig the asylum system by getting a, a priest to say that they've become Christians, even yeah. though they probably don't know the first book in the Bible. I mean, it's, it's, it's a joke. We have our asylum acceptance rates. It's, it's more than double that of the EU. Even though, for some reason, you know, many countries like to, to say, oh, the, the Britain is run by these far-right Tories that, are, that hate immigrants. Oh, sure, though, sure. If, yeah. you, if you came here as an immigrant, your chances of leaving are minimal. Yeah. Honestly. I know. Absolutely hopeless. Anyway, listen, we've got loads of great stories to talk to uh, uh, talk about throughout the course of the show, so we'll have you back very soon. Thank you very much indeed. You're watching The Independent Republic with Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, really energy giants are still hell-bent on raiding your bank balance and everything you've got in your pockets. Stay tuned. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman. 
not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a It's on a uh, late-night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for taking the mic. Whenever I'm asked for my top three best pieces of advice, I always say, number one, never buy anything at the top of the market. Number two, always question authority. And number three, don't ever pay for your energy via a direct debit. The first two might seem a little bit obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many people have never heeded my advice to allow a commercial organisation the right to reach into your bank account and remove funds whenever they feel like it, no matter whether you owe them anything or not. There are countless cases of people having problems with direct debits, but none are more frequent or more devastating to people's finances as the acts of energy companies. They work on the principle that you should pay for energy you haven't yet used. They pretend that it is in your favour to budget for proposed increases in usage and in price, and they gouge you for it. They even offer you preferential rates for signing up to the direct debit method of payment. And they punish you with higher prices if you refuse. But trust me, refusing is still the best way to go. Take Victoria Corrin Mitchell this week. She is the wife of comedian David Mitchell and a journalist, author and TV personality in her own right. Somebody with a high profile. But things got so bad for her this week, she had to threaten her own energy provider with legal action after they took thousands of pounds from her bank account which they were not owed and to which they were not entitled. She said she had been personally driven to despair and she shared her story with her 700,000 followers on social media. The company in question is Ovo Energy, but it is by no means the only one that's doing this. And it appears, as I've repeatedly warned, thousands of people have been chased for money aggressively by these companies, even though none of it is owed. It's absolutely disgusting. Victoria's problems came to light just a few months after the artist Sir Grayson Perry had a similar problem with EDF Energy, who said they emptied his bank account, claiming he owed them £39,000 a month, when the real bill was actually £300. In his case, he said he received a series of 15 bogus bills, ranging from 200 quid to £6,000, and he was told the money would be taken all at once by direct debit. No choice, uh, no chance. 
Victoria was so incensed with what happened that she asked other customers what their experiences with OVO were, and she was not surprised to find that there were many, many thousands of people with similar stories. Arbitrary amounts charged, unexplained increases in bills, and no control over your own financial affairs. That's what you sign up to when you agree to pay by direct debit. And that's why I say you should never do it. A spokesman for OVO said, they're always striving to learn lessons and provide the best possible experience for customers. No doubt, they believe it. But there's only one way to avoid it. You know what to do. Now, here at Talk TV and Talk Radio, we told you it was happening during lockdown, and now it's written in plain English. Nicola Sturgeon politicised COVID. This comes from the Doommeister General of the pandemic himself, Sir Patrick Vallance. In his diary extracts published by the COVID inquiry, Vallance wrote that Sturgeon's decision to force masks on schoolchildren was, quote, not based on medical advice. It also contradicted the advice to schools given by the chief medical officers of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, meaning the terror of mask wearing forced upon children was all to score points against Boris. And similarly, it appears that that was the same for vaccinating children in order to keep them safe and to keep them going to school. That turned out to be a crock of nonsense as well. Joining me at the hot desk tonight is Arabella Skinner, Chief of Staff at Us For Them. Arabella, very nice to see you. Good to, uh, to have you on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you, I mean, Mike. Yourself and Molly Kingsley and your entire organisation has been fighting this mm. tooth and nail ever since it happened, as we were at the time, as all of our children were being told they had to go to school um, after being off for months and months and months, but they had mm. to wear masks and Absolutely. they had to be vaccinated. I mean, it's absolutely shocking, this, isn't it? It is. It's absolutely shocking, Mike. And it's shocking because we knew this at the time. We were worried about it at the time. We were basically gaslit by our own government and by the people we were meant to trust and we, the scientists. We already know that Matt Hancock has told us in his diaries and in his WhatsApps that they decided this wasn't worth the fight with Nicola Sturgeon. And we also now have Sir Patrick Vallance, who was meant to be the independent person thinking about the science, saying totally agreeing with this as well. And this was way back in August 2020. And this went on until you know, halfway through 2022. And it wasn't until the end of 2021, literally the last day of 2021, that there was a risk assessment done for our children to actually work out whether this was harmful or not. Yeah. And that was despite us consistently asking the Department for Education for this and actually going to pre-action letters on judicial reviews on at least two occasions mm -hmm. and being told that this is something that needed to happen and was in the interests of our children. Yes. Well, this is it. I mean, it was the worst kind of... Um what I would call dictatorship from, from the government and its scientific advisors, because in the end, not only were you not supposed to question it, not only were you not really allowed to question it, but if you did question it, you were treated as if you were some kind of pariah, some kind of revolutionary, some kind of terrorist, practically. I mean, they were list drawn up with people like you uh, and Absolutely. me with our, with our names on it. Julie Hartley Brewer as well, Molly, I'm sure, as well. Yep. You know, it's Absolutely. unforgivable. And I really don't think that we should let them get away with this in the sense that, you know, it's revealed in this COVID inquiry, which has already been called a ridiculous, useless and biased anyway. Um, and we're supposed to just walk away and go, oh, that's OK, Sir Patrick, don't you worry about it. You carry on. I think he's now working for the Blair Foundation, no big surprise Absolutely. there. And I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there, Mike. The real concern, obviously, we know what happened during the pandemic and we know the issues that affected our children and we know the impact of it's having now, particularly with speech and learning difficulties. But there is absolutely no accountability. And we may be surprised when we get the first report from the COVID inquiry, but I'm holding my breath on that one. But this is what we should be looking at. These are people who have said they lied. They yeah. said they followed the science. They told us to do things. They have now admitted that it was totally political. But there doesn't seem to be any accountability or anyone even really challenging or questioning them on why they did this and how they did this. And more worryingly, nothing to stop them doing it again. Yeah. Well, exactly right, because presumably the next time, if there is a next time, there won't be Sir Patrick Vallance, there'll be somebody else. But his official quote in uh, his diary is this, very few, if any children or teenagers, will come to long-term harm from COVID-19 due solely to attending school. Now, um, I have teenage children. When they were told that they could go back to school finally, they were told to get vaccinated, they were told to wear a mask. 
One of my children refused to do both and was victimised continually by the teachers because he refused to do what they told him. We have had absolute horror stories throughout the pandemic of children and some children who really had genuinely um, serious issues, sensory issues around wearing masks and couldn't couldn't wear them. And let's remember, these were children that it wasn't like adults who just had to go in and out of the shop or occasionally on public transport. They were often leaving their houses at 7.30, getting on a school bus with their mask on and then wearing a mask all day, yeah. all day. No one else was in that kind of situation. And these children who weren't able to wear them were penalised. We had examples of children who had to sit in the school reception area and hope that she, teachers gave them work. We have examples of children who became ill with Tourette's and serious tics. Mm. We have, you know, the absentee crisis is, has its roots in the pandemic. It has its roots in the fact that we sent kids home and told them education doesn't, it wasn't important. And also we seriously impacted children who, found, who were treated badly and found the whole thing too traumatic and can't come back to school. Right. And I mean, also you, um, me and, and, and Molly have also spoken about how there's no real proper representation at the COVID inquiry for the harms that were done to our children. I mean, do you think this has a chance of changing that? Um, I very much doubt it. Uh, we've had the, they've announced the next three modules, which take you up to oh, sort of the end of 2025, early 2026. And we still haven't had education and children, the dates they're starting. They are working on, they're working on research projects, but, but they haven't announced when we're even going to start talking about children. And the earliest will probably be early 2026. That's six years after we shut down schools. Yeah. And, and, you know, a child who was 12 then, starting second year secondary, will be doing their A-levels. I mean, it is just ridiculous. Mm. It really is. Arabella, th Arabella, thank you very much indeed. Arabella Skinner there, Chief of Staff, uh, us for them. We'll keep fighting the good fight because this is, I tell you, uh, one of the biggest stories of this decade and it needs to be properly covered and it needs to be properly uh, excavated and we need to get proper answers from the people who lied to us, the scientists who didn't follow the science. Unbelievable. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's been a jam-packed hour and we're going to cross the pond to check in on the Don after this break. See you very shortly. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Grammy with Talk. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're online, and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, funeral home horror in Hull. A grieving widow is among the family members left devastated after her husband's body is discovered in a freezer, despite believing he'd been cremated. Plus, time is ticking on TikTok as the US government overwhelmingly passes a bill that could lead to a nationwide ban. And Cheltenham races rebrand their Ladies' Day to Gender Neutral Style Wednesday. Oh dear. There's something very odd going on in Hull, I have to tell you. The police are investigating one of the most bizarre happenings in many a year, and it all revolves around a funeral home, mysterious cases of fraud involving dead bodies, and a distribution of ashes that aren't really ashes. Now, if that opening statement hasn't grabbed your interest, then nothing will. The story came to light this week when police raided the premises of the legacy international funeral directors in the city. They were not prepared for what they found. They recovered 35 bodies and some suspected human ashes it will is likely to become one of the biggest scandals ever to hit the funeral business in this country. Thousands of grieving relatives have contacted a hotline set up as part of the investigation. Many of them have been in receipt of ashes from the business purported to be the remains of their loved ones, only to discover that they were not. The question is, if the ashes were not the correct remains, what were they? One grieving widow who had her husband's ashes turned into jewellery, which is quite a common thing to do these days, has been told by the police that they found her husband's body in a freezer at the funeral directors, the police are calling it an extremely complex and sensitive investigation involving specialists from around the country. Another victim, called Billy Jo Suffel, she lost her father and her brother in one five-day period, says she is now convinced that the coffin that she kissed in a final goodbye to her dad was in fact empty. It's such a weird story that no one actually has an explanation for what might have happened or why a funeral director would keep bodies in a freezer while pretending to cremate or bury them. The police have arrested a man and a woman on suspicion of the prevention of a lawful and decent burial, fraud by false representation, and fraud by abuse of position. And they're also in the process of moving ashes they have recovered to a mortuary. As yet, they have not been prepared to say what has actually happened. But as ever, there's plenty of speculation online and on social media about what was going on. The funeral business is a pretty unregulated place, believe it or not, and there are now calls for inspections and proper regulations to be put into place to avoid this sort of thing happening again. But as more and more people opt out of even having funerals, not least because they're so expensive, is it any wonder? Families are having to relive the pain and sorrow of seeing their loved ones die. This scandal has reopened all those old wounds. The police need to tell them what's going on, and soon. Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at all of tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper tonight. And here I have in front of me a page nine uh, exclusive story about the Maddie McCann uh, situation. Machine gun cops have swooped on the home of Maddie suspect's getaway driver, Powell. Uh, this is all happening uh, over in Germany. Armed cops acting on a new lead in the Madeleine McCann case surrounded a potential witness's home in a dramatic raise, up to 10 police with machine guns spent an hour outside the heavily guarded property uh, in Germany. Officers from the BKA, Germany's FBI, are now searching uh, for the man in question. His name is Ralph H. Uh, he's believed to have some very important information that they think will be useful as they continue to search for Madeleine McCann, who, of course, went missing in 2007. 
a very, very long time ago. Uh, we'll bring you more on that story and more from everything else uh, in the newspapers as well. But for right now, let's go over to the United States where we're set up for another presidential rematch. American voters heading to the polls in November with Donald Trump and Joe Biden once more each securing enough delegates to clinch their party's presidential nominations. They come as the US moved a step closer to banning TikTok today following a vote in the House of Representatives. Let's bring in the Chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Mr Greg Swenson. Greg, welcome to the Independent Republic. Nice to see you. Great to see you, Mike. Great to see you. I mean, I don't think anyone was surprised that it would be Biden, Trump too. Um, but this is the official um, count, I suppose, coming in. So what's different, would you say, between now and the last time around? Oh, it's a, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Last, you know, last time around, Biden was supposed to be the, the unifier, the, the president that would bring the country together. Mm. He was, you know, he was propped as a moderate. Right. Well, now we know he's been nothing. He has. He's, he's been very left wing. He's been he? extremely left wing. He's been controlled by the the Bernie Sanders and mm. the Jeremy Corbyn wing right. of his party, and and he's done nothing to unify the country. And you saw that in the State of the Union speech yeah. last night. Sixty percent of the viewers thought it was divisive. Right. I hate to use that word from yes. the left, but but it very much uh, Well, it's it was very true. political, wasn't it, rather yeah. than about America? It, it really was. It was basically a campaign speech, yeah. right? So he, he yelled, shouted the whole time. Mm. It, it was, you know, talked about, again, once, once again, repelling voters mm. by talking about the MAGA of extreme right and yes. the Trump people. It's not a way to appeal to voters. I was really surprised by mm. I think so. And he's got very little going for him, hasn't he? You know, the oh, yeah. war uh, is going on still in Ukraine. Yeah. He hasn't got a great body of support behind backing the war uh, from the Ukrainian side. He doesn't really seem to be doing much to stand up to Russia. Right. Um, he doesn't really seem to be supporting Israel in the way that many Americans would expect him to do. That's right. And yet, you know, he's sending his uh, Secretary of State over there all the time, sort of trying to get ceasefires organised. Sure. He predicted there would be a ceasefire by Monday of this week because that's the start of Ramadan. He got that wrong. Yep. You know, meanwhile, he's got millions of uh, illegal migrants coming over the border, yeah. you know, He's he's failing. The economy on, is about the only thing he's got going for him, right? Yeah, not even that is is you know not exactly perfect, right? Mm. So there's some some metrics that are positive, like GDP growth, but GDP growth will be much lower this mm. year than last, and it's really all about inflation when you talk about the, the economy. So you can see some good numbers coming out, yeah. but if they don't affect the people, the people are really right. upset. Food prices are up 20 percent, petrol prices are up 40 percent. Yeah. So. He's failing on the economy. He's failing on the border. He's failing on foreign policy. Those are the top three issues for Americans. Mm. So this is this election is really well suited for President Trump because his policies and his outcomes were so much better than Biden. Right. So this becomes a referendum on two administrations. Trump right. wins. And of course, last time they made a big deal, didn't they, Democrats? And Joe Biden being a career politician, having been you know foreign affairs advisor, been on the foreign select committee for years and years and years, been vice president of Barack Obama, knew the. White House inside out. Yeah. He's made a complete brick of it though, hasn't he? Absolutely. And then, you know, they thought it would be, you know, the adults are coming back, right. you know, America's back. Well, the first things he did right out of the gates were, you know, offend our allies, yeah. you know, the Saudis, the Israelis, the UK yeah. for that matter. And then of course the debacle in Af Afghanistan. Yeah. So Robert Gates, Forgotten about that. you know, Robert Gates, the former uh, Secretary of Defense, you know, argued that Biden's been wrong on every foreign policy issue for the last 50 years, right. and he's continued that record. It's, mm. <laughs> it's really yeah. difficult to do. But it is quite difficult managed to do. To do but, and, and indeed, all he's ever known in his life is working uh, in that Washington, right. uh, inside that beltway in Washington, which today actually did something quite surprising, I thought. Uh, let's talk about the TikTok yeah. vote, because House of Representatives unusually united quite a few um, Democrats and Republicans yeah. voted to ban TikTok. Now... Donald Trump has a slightly different view because he doesn't feel that he wants to leave everything up to Mark Zuckerberg, right. which is fair enough. Yeah. Um, but do you think it could happen? Could they actually ban TikTok? Well, there, there were only 65 no votes, and that's, you know, as you said, it's you know the, an unusual amount of, of bipartisanship. Right. So you know it could happen. I hope it doesn't mm. because I think the bill is written wrong. It, it's it's way too. It seems quite un-American to ban a social media on yeah. the basis that it's run by a foreign government. Yes. I mean, look, th there there are restrictions on foreign ownership of newspapers mm. and TV stations. I get it. And I think there are flaws with TikTok, no doubt about right. it. I'm not arguing that TikTok is great. I think, you know, the fact that the, Ch the Communist Party of China has access to that kind of data mm. is troubling. But it's the problem is it's too broad, mm. and it gives the president, whoever it is, but in this case, Biden, who 
has a history of censorship, has a history of, you know, going back to October of 2020 with censoring the New York Post right. and the Hunter Biden laptop. So those are really troubling situations that we don't want to see repeated. So I, I hope that they, they tighten this bill up and just make it about TikTok right. specifically yes. and not give Biden or any other president license to censor. I think that's important. Well, also, if the US is anything like the UK, I mean, we were, you know, two yards away from welcoming Huawei basically into yep. Downing Street yep. and into every government department to run the communication system. You know, eventually it didn't happen, but it, it very nearly happened, and who yep. knows how close they got. But you would right. probably have to imagine that with China owning an awful lot of American debt, there's going to be an awful lot of Chinese, you know, fingers in pies, if you like, in the US. Without a doubt. And you're not going to somehow stop Chinese influence or get a Chinese knowledge base right. by just banning TikTok, are hey? you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a really small part of this big machine. If you look at the dependency on rare earth minerals, for example, other critical minerals, right. you know, we have a, a really un, unfair dependency on China for, and, and these things are, you know, very much involved in national security and defense. So yeah, it, it's a problem, but I don't think the way to fix the problem is to, is to give the president the ability to ban any social right. network or any any media platform. That's you know that's what happened in October right. 2020. Well, we'll have the same again. conversation as we're having here about extremism, won't we? And suddenly Rumble will be an extremist platform <laughs> and Gab will be an extremist yeah. platform and Truth Social will be an extremist yeah, platform of course. and they'll all get banned. Yeah, and they shut they shut down several platforms in, in uh, early 2021. So, you know, this is something that we've seen a lot of. So I think if a TikTok ban five years ago might have might have just sailed right through right. Uh, because of the national security issues. But right now, there's a real suspicion, both on the right and the left, of censorship. Mm. We've seen too much of it. It's, it's a real issue, especially in an election year. We don't want to give the president or anyone else that kind of power to censor opposition media. Right. So from now until the conventions in the summer, what are the kind of you know sort of signposts to, to, to look out for, as it were, for, for people watching this tonight? You know, what's the next kind of signal as to how Donald Trump is doing and how Biden is doing? Well, I, I think the polls are are pretty clear right now. And, and look, both both candidates have flaws. You know, Trump is not the perfect candidate. He, he's never polled above fifty. I think that's a risk for the Republican Party. He, he's topped out at forty-seven. CBS had him at fifty-two last right. week, but that's an outlier. Right. But the best thing going for Trump is Biden. You know, Trump's negatives are minus 10. Yes. He's at, you know, 54 and, and or 44 and 54. But Biden's at 38 and 59. He's minus 21. Right. So I, I think if unless and and then the question is, what could Biden do like Harry Truman in 48 right. to change the momentum? I just can't imagine yeah. what he could possibly do. He tried it on Thursday. It was a failure. Well, we just had a conversation about um, how bad uh, the Tories are in, and what a bad yeah. state the Tories are in. But there are still some clinging on to the fact that if we just go through the summer and England have a great result of the Euros and somehow we win <laughs> loads of gold to Team GP at the <laughs> yeah. Olympics in Paris, um, it might actually improve things. And, you know, sometimes sporting events can turn around. Sure. I mean, the Olympics obviously always big for the Americans. Uh, yeah. Um, but again, Biden is not a man that likes to wrap himself in the flag, whereas Donald Trump is. Right, and and I think, you know, so the Olympics will be better for Trump. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, I think any Olympics are good for the Republican presidents, typically. Uh, I would argue also that that there is no good news between now and then. Remember, the, the Democratic National Convention is in Chicago, right. which is a completely failed state right now, yes. failed city, failed state of Illinois, and that's not going to showcase well. They'll try to clean it up. They'll try to keep the homicides down right. during the convention, but that's not really going to but show But there'll well. be presumably lots of demonstrations as well, oh, yeah. pro-Palestinian and, and others. You'll have that, and, and look, the, the African-American community in Chicago is becoming really fed up mm. with the migrant crisis, right. right? So the resources are being taken away from the African-American community. It's one third of the electorate in Chicago. It's very meaningful. If Biden doesn't win, the Democrats have always been completely dependent on black, the black vote. Yeah. They, they typically win 90% of the black vote. If they don't get 85, they lose elections. And right now they're polling at 60 mm. with African-Americans. So that's a disaster yeah. looming. And that'll be showcased in Chicago because of the prominence of the African-American community there, but also the fact that the city is a complete it's and utter a complete mess. complete basket case, yeah. absolutely. That's such a shame. I used to yeah. love Chicago. Beautiful what a great, city. I have a, a home there, town. which kills me. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable stuff. Yeah. Greg, good to see you. Thank great you very much. You, Greg, great Thanks for having with me. the word from uh, the United States of America.
And now it's time for Royal Photo Wars. The Duke and Duchess of Montecito have added fuel to the fire that's embroiling the Princess of Wales's edited family photo. Sources close to the couple say Meghan's too perfect to have made the same mistake. And this is despite the fact that they edited their own official photos to include an enormous willow tree uh, from which you get wood, from which, of course, you make planks. Um, it's a ridiculous storm in a teacup. It's still going on. Now, days later, we're arguing about whether or not people use Photoshop, whether it should be used. I still maintain that it was a very strange thing that happened. Let's talk now to a proper expert, though, the Royal Editor, Mr Robert Jobson. Robert, very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. I mean, I'm, I'm like you, I think, um, pretty fed up with all of the people making all sorts of ridiculous stories up about why this has happened. But I still ask the one question that hasn't been answered by anyone. How was it allowed to happen? How did it... How was somebody in Kensington Palace let it happen? I think everyone was moving too quickly. I think everyone was trying to please the principals without necessarily doing the correct checks. And it was at a weekend. It was a mistake. A uh, genuine mistake by her. But I would have thought Catherine would have known better. You know, she's, she's an amateur photographer. She knows that tweaking and messing around with photographs can lead to people losing their jobs. So I think that doing it was a bit silly. But once it's done, you know, and she's owned up to it, I think we should probably move on. Obviously, the, the, Mon the Duke and Duchess of Montecito don't necessarily want us to move on because it's a, a negative on, on Kate's copybook. But my feeling is it's, she's owned up to it. It's, it's a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. I mean, the thing is, though, it is strange. I mean, the bottom line, you do have to remember that, you know, it is a question of integrity. It's not, and no one's having to go at her personally, but the institution should not have allowed this to happen because, you know, you do have to trust what's coming out of a, pal a palace. If it's releasing official photographs, you have to trust it. And you do have to be able to trust the information. So I think it was a mistake that was made. And um, and it does call into question the integrity of the palace, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you and I, I'm afraid, are old enough to remember, you know, some of the proper, not scandals perhaps so much, but certainly sort of royal gaffes all the way back to Prince Edward and it's a royal knockout, all the way back to Fergie and the toe sucking, you know, Squidgy Gate, you know, all of the stuff that happened when Princess Diana was, was around giving leaks to newspapers and pretending she hadn't spoken to them. I mean, you know, the royal family have got quite a long history of uh, being, shall we say, economical with the truth at, at times when it suits them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's fair. I, mean, I think one of them was Prince Edward's wedding. That Prince William looked quite grumpy, so they took his head off and put a picture of him smiling. <laughs> um, so, and that made page leads at the time because even right. then it was seen as ridiculous. But yeah. in this day and age of AI, with so much going on, I'm not sure you've seen all the memes, you know, with T John Terry yeah. appearing on in the back of the, uh, the pictures and others of this picture holding the European Cup. You know, there's, there's, then it's, it's become slightly farcical and. The, the, on a more serious issue, you know, these things in a hundred years' time, but pictures that are released by the palace are, are historical. And, yeah. you know, this guy who's standing on behind his mum one day will be the king. And you can't really doctor photographs like that. It's not no. It's not great. The thing that's slightly weird is they do have um, Andrew Parsons, who is, a, you know, who's one of, who's Boris, who used to work for the Prime Minister, actually, Boris Johnson and other Prime Ministers, working with them. Yeah. So I don't know why they didn't just let, you know, perfect, you know, let... Andrew, take the picture. Mm. I mean, if you want a wall built, you, you get a bricklayer. If you yeah. want a phot photograph taken, get a professional <laughs> photographer. It's as simple as that. Well, that's yeah. right. And also, if they'd, want, if they'd wanted it to be released, you know, as it was kind of altered, surely they could have just put it out on their own Twitter account and they wouldn't have had to send it via a news agency. And in that way, they wouldn't have had to be scrutinised in the same kind of way because they, they happen to have rules where they're not allowed to run, you know, Photoshop pictures. Well, I mean, there are different. I mean, I think the thing is, though, that we are being run in a bit of a woke world at the moment because mm. in America they have different rules. You know, Reuters, AP, and these agencies, uh, AFP, and all these other agencies, you know, which are really effectively run by Getty, run by American Americans, have got different rules than they would necessarily over, have over here. Th these rules have clearly been breached, the rules that would have over here. But at the same time, I do think that it was Sunday that this happened. It's been now like an international story, it seems, right. for, for the White House sort of weighing in and saying, we'd never do it. You know, it does <laughs> seem a little over the top. But, um, and I feel sorry for Kate, actually, because I'm sure actually 
all she was trying to do was put out the best picture possible. Oh, yeah. Now and listen, people and there are plenty of people... ...whether the picture was right. Yeah, and there are plenty of people in this country who think that there's no reason why we should even be going on about it, even now, even still. You know, but, of course, the other thing about the American market is that, you know, again, you and I have been around long enough to know that before social media, some of the American tabloids, like the National Enquirer and the Star in those days, used yeah. to write some horrific stories about Chuck and yeah, Die, right. you know, Chuck and Die screaming match, you yeah. know, and you'd read them and you'd be going... What the hell are they talking about? You know, where are they getting this from? And they were literally just one. making it up. I missed another one. Right, right. We're just making it up. And I think that in this day and age with AI, it's frightening. You know, you see, you see online, you see people um, you know, giving you know, William giving a speech. It's his voice and saying all sorts of ridiculous things. So integrity and trust and honesty and authenticity do matter when they're coming out of government or palace um, institutions because. Otherwise, what are the public supposed to believe? We've got an election coming up. I'm sure AI is going to play an, a, a part in that because people don't believe what they see at the best of times, you know. Mm. But, you know, you do expect official photographs released through an official medium not to be doctored, and sadly it was doctored in this case. Yeah. So, I mean, in the end, it's been not a bad week for uh, Meghan Markle. I mean, I know it's only Wednesday, but, you know, she won a lawsuit against her, uh, her sister, Samantha, and um, or her half-sister, Samantha, um, and now she's sort of come out of this looking like um, she's not in the wrong, which is always a good week, I guess, for her. Well, I mean, there was that photograph, wasn't it, it was released. Um, I think the photographer's gone a bit a bit mad about somebody saying about this tree in the background. I right. think Tom Bauer said it was, uh, and he's now saying the tree was always in the background. It wasn't fake, even though I think he said on BBC that it was. Well, I, read, <laughs> um, I read an interview with him. it was a him. colour photograph and he's turned it to a yeah. black and white photograph. Right. I mean, but, you know, at the end of the day, they fiddle with photographs as well. So yeah. I don't think they should really enter the debate. No, they shouldn't. No, I read an interview that he had done at the time of the picture coming out, well, in, which not, well, in which not only he yeah. said that the picture had been tampered with, but that he wasn't even there when the picture was taken because it was taken remotely. He was in Europe and they were there and he put the tree in in the background afterwards and it was the tree of love or some absolute crap, you know. But basically... Well, he's now saying that's not... He's now saying that's not the case. He's <laughs> producing negatives and he's saying, what was he saying? That, you know, but this, again, Mike, this is his truth. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, that's the, other, that's the other great get-out clause now, the one that we'll all have to use at some point or other in our career and go, well, it was my truth and I'm sticking to it. I'm not having a you having a go at me. Yeah, I mean, I do feel sorry for Ken. And I think that and everyone's having to go out the PR department of Buckingham, you know, Kensington Palace. So I, can, I can see why, but, you know, this is what's happened now. I think everybody is demanding things so quickly. Um, the reality is that they put that on, on their website uh, on their Instagram page, and then issued it to the press, not thinking they were going to undergo go the same level of scrutiny. But you know, I think that they know, you know, they're the heir to the, you know, they're the future king and queen. Maybe they're just going to have to slow things down. I mean, I heard the other day that the king had had a whole all of these official photographs taken of him in his uniform, you know, yeah. of his uniforms, official uniforms. These are very important historical pictures. Didn't like them, said so them all redone and repaid for the whole lot. You know, with the with the lighting and everything, yeah. because he had to get it absolutely right. Well, I think actually there's a degree of um, when you're dealing with this level of history and you know, people are going to be looking at these things in a thousand years. You don't want to be looking at dodgy photographs, dodgy <laughs> photographs. You want to be looking at the real McCoy, don't you? No, exactly right. And speaking of the real McCoy, uh, Ladies Day at Cheltenham today, although they're trying to reclaim it and call it um, Style Wednesday. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later on. Uh, the Queen was there. Uh, lots of pictures of her doing the rounds. Um, this is in the sun tomorrow. And they're off. Uh, a very nice green number. I remember um, you and I once attending the, um, the Derby in Epsom, uh, where you mostly did all the work and I did all the drinking. That, that doesn't surprise me, and I remember in those <laughs> days there was always a press tent. There was a press tent where I think Mr. Mike Parry was uh, spent most of the time. With, he did, yeah. He was carried um, out of it on yeah. a stretcher at one point. I think <laughs> that's right. And there were all sorts of shouting and things going on. But it was a different time then, you know. Yeah, we we will be holed up. But yeah, the Queen. The thing is, though, with this is the Queen. Of course, is taking the lead in so many things. You know, I'm I'm sure that um, you know, years ago we, we couldn't have possibly imagined this, but no. you know, there she is, the Queen leading the royal family. At, Westminster Abbey, now she's here at, at Cheltenham, but she's there representing the King. Of course, the King's is still um, undergoing his treatment at, um, you know, he's undergoing his, his cancer treatment, and I don't think we're really going to see a lot of him apart from 
photographs that are released by the palace, so there will be legitimate photographs of him meeting the Prime Minister or ambassadors, etc. But I think she's doing a sterling job, um, Camilla. And, yeah. Uh, I think the Queen, you know, she, I know that everyone had a go because uh, she had a short holiday. Well, she's 76. I think she's entitled to holiday now and again. You know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely right. And, I mean, it hasn't been a great start to the year for, for any of them, really, has it? And so I guess things can only get better, as they used to say in Tony Blair's government. Yeah, well, let's hope so. I mean, obviously, the, the King has got uh, his treatment undergoing and the, you've got Kate uh, undergoing her... Uh, recovery. I'm sure that that will go well. Let's hope for you. Fingers crossed everything goes well for the king. He's, I think he's carrying out his constitutional duties as much as he can. And obviously, he can't go to big public gatherings. You know, the, he, I'm sure his immune system's down. Right. And so they, they have to take care with him. But, you know, he's, a, he's he'll be getting frustrated and I'm sure we will be desperate to get back yeah. uh, to work as soon as he's fit well enough to do so. And do you think we'll see Harry and Meghan ever in this uh, realm? Particularly again? Again, yeah. I do, but not necessarily for happy events. But I do think we will see them again, yeah. Right, OK. Well, we, I'm not going to say we're going to look forward to it, but we shall see. Robert, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Robert Jobson there. Cheers, Mike. The royal uh, author. A uh, man has written many great books about the royal family, and uh, he and I have got many stories to tell. Maybe one day we'll tell them. Uh, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, Justin Welby's warning against the new definition of extremism. And Japan's Space One rocket launch attempt ends in a fiery explosion. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All right, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Well, it's nice to see the Metropolitan Police getting something right for once. The scourge of American tourists frequenting uh, the capital and visiting various landmarks is well known. And whilst they talk loudly and get drunk far too often, uh, it's just bang out of order when they think this capital is their playground. So they got a bit of a shock and a surprise when they were mocking and hurling abuse at a King's Guard today. An armed officer accosted the brats, threatening to arrest them and throw them out of the grounds. How's about throwing them back on the plane as well? Have a look. To serve their country, all right? They take their job seriously. They are responsible for success for this facility. They are not an object of ridicule. I um, appreciate you having fun. He's not having fun. He's got a long day. There's a lot of hours he's got to do. It is tiring, exhausting. You're taking the piss out of him, all right? We do not appreciate that. I will ask you to leave the facility, all right? All right, just piss off. I mean, that's it's very nice to see a police officer actually protecting. Because you always feel sorry for those guys when you actually have to um, watch what happens when you're standing there or when they're sitting on horseback. And at the end of the day, nobody can talk to them because, you know, they can't talk back. And it's pretty unfair. But so once in a while, we like to give a little bit of a, a big hello to the police and well done to them. So thank you very much indeed to the Metropolitan Police for doing something right just for a change. Now, uh, three, two, one, a blast off. Well, not quite over in Japan. A rocket carrying an experimental Japanese spy satellite has exploded after its launch. Debris fell from the sky with charred pieces of rocket littering the ground after the explosion. The rocket called Kairos was blasting off from the mountains in West Japan and the company behind the project had hoped to be the first Japanese firm to put a satellite into space. I'm afraid not. Good luck next time. So, lots to talk about because so many stories have passed through this show since I last had the panel here. They're all back with me now. Uh, we've got, of course, Megan Gittos, uh, we've got um, Tom Slater, and we've got Esther Kraku. Uh, and there they are, looking in all their finery. We've got some <laughs> papers here for you as well. I've got some money in front of me as well, which if you do really well, uh, I might throw your way. These are uh, proper independent Republican Mike Graham. Um, I don't want you fighting over it, so okay, see how yeah. far it goes. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes all the way to you. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have to Listen. do anything for it. You don't have to do anything for it. It was great, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's talk about the Metropolitan Police. I know how often you guys walk past Horse Guards Parade, but I always feel really sorry for those guys because they're mm. standing there, that guy was in his long coat, or they're on a horse, and there's Americans kind of poking them and going, yeah. does your lips move? And, you know, <laughs> are you for real? And all, and all that sort of stuff. And so I was quite pleased to see the Metropolitan Police. Yeah, I was really pleased to see them. I love how we know that they're American and not Canadian. Yeah. Because the Canadians well, are Well, you can polite. tell. Too polite. Exactly, you know. too polite. And the also, Americans the Canadians like... say, oot and a boot. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, the Americans oh, yeah. don't say that, so yeah. you can always tell they sound a bit... Uh, but they speak proper English, they say bins, not trash cans. Yeah, they do. So anyway, full marks to, uh, to our boy. He was also armed as well. Yeah. But of course, they're not that worried about that because they see that all the time. Yeah, they're used to it. Yeah. Do you reckon he wouldn't have got that specially just to... I think, well, I mean, the only, <laughs> slight, the only slight drawback, I suppose, for it is that is this the new woke police, you know, who go around mm. telling people off for having a go at other people? And, you know, next they'll be telling you not to have a go at people in, outside of a pub or something. You know? yeah. <laughs> so that's not a very nice way to speak to them, is it? At least they're doing something. You know? Yeah, at least they're doing something. I mean, I'm, I usually criticise the Metropolitan Police, so I'm happy when they're telling off a few American tourists. Well, it's nice to see them doing something yeah, which exactly. is not trying to be popular. Yeah, you know. and you know, it's not even about them being American. It, well, it is a little bit, it always is. But um, <laughs> I do think that, like, I've seen them and they are, the teenagers, it's like they never left their house before. No, I know. And it must be annoying not being able to react. Yes. And there's always a sweet child that wants to go over and just wave. Right. And they're just, they and people never do really forget get in. These are actually proper fighting soldiers, you know. Yeah. They actually yeah. do go to places like Afghanistan and Iraq mm. and, you know, yeah. wherever else they, they, they go. And they actually do fight in proper regiments. You know, they're not just, you know, sort of tin pot soldiers who stand there like something out of the Nutcracker, <laughs> you know, wait, <laughs> waiting for somebody to polish their boots for them. <laughs> now, I don't know whether any of you have got children. I don't think you have, have you? No. no. Um, so now I can talk to you because this is the rise of dinks. <laughs> Childless Britain, it says here. Okay. Couples without offspring, dual income, no kids, sharing details of their travel-heavy lifestyles on social media uh, in a rebuke, supposedly, to the stigma that they used to feel for not having children. I mean, it's quite a personal thing, I suppose. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say you should have children, you shouldn't have children, but there do seem to be more people now deciding not to have them. But I think that's lack of invest investment into families. It? And it's uh, we've had a Tory government for 14 years, and if you actually look at why women and men are choosing not to have children, the Times always print with this about 
why women aren't having children. It's both. And, you know, it's really expensive. Childcare is really expensive. Mm. There's not a whole lot of incentive about it. And, you know, I don't think that... I think on both sides, especially on social media, there's this kind of argument between those who do and those who yeah. don't, that, no, my life's better, my life's yeah. better. And, uh, but these people say it's really expensive to have children apparently keep going on these very big fancy foreign holidays. Well, I think, so, I think this is know, the thing. I think, look at me, I'm having a great time. Here I am at Kilimanjaro. Yeah, you know? I think it's more about uh, sacrifice as well. I think they don't want yeah. to say outright, I actually just like to have a life that's about me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's their prerogative. I also think kind of social support has, has broken down. You know, families no longer live together. You don't yeah, have absolutely. sort of grandma and mm. your mother being able to help or like other family members. It's really difficult. Mm. If you live isolated from the rest of your family in a social network, it, it makes having a child that much more daunting yes. because you're spending a lot of money on the child, but also psychologically it takes its toll. You've, you've really become detached from the person that you used to know because most of your resources... But paradoxically, of course, we're only really talking about dinks as middle-class people, aren't we? Of course. Yes. You yeah, know, absolutely. there is quite a lot of incentive if you're um, unemployed, if yeah, you're on if benefits, you're, exactly. to have more kids because the more kids you get, the more benefits you get. Yeah, it's just yeah. become this big kind of lifestyle row on yeah. social media. On the one side, you have the kind of smug dinks, as it were, yeah. <laughs> weird phrase to say. Smug yeah. dinks, <laughs> who, right, though. Yeah, <laughs> who are kind of going and looking, you know, we're not weighed down by children. But then you also get this reaction sometimes, which is you're idiots in a yeah. few years, you're going to realise yeah. these. So it's all very Old unedifying. Right. But, um, as you say, I think it's a very middle class. Well, I saw Lily Allen the other day saying that, you know, she loves all of her children, but they ruined her career. And you go, well, that's what, a nice... That's a convenient, that's, uh, convenient excuse. Well, yeah, well, and yeah. also... But it's a nice thing to have for your kids to read, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I, you know, I love you, but you've uh, ruined my life. the first time they were ever in the paper is when she was blaming them for the... Yeah. Well, the that, thing is, she's no Beyonce. Comes <laughs> with all due respect, like they've no, ruined my yeah. career. I think also, you had if you're a rock star, I think career. you probably have as many kids as you like. When they were smallest, that album, I'm a fan of her music, but that... I don't know anyone that picks that album up. And that's when yeah. they were at their smallest. Well, yeah, exactly, so it's like yeah. kind it's of just, like when they I can walk it, and talk, you have no excuse. Yeah, yeah, I think it just it was a really bad. She's album. not going to have childcare issues. Is she, you know, no. trying exactly. to get hold of a baby. I mean, she's similarly, similarly, there were, and I mean, I, I because I know she people is. that are like this. Mm. There used to be people that we called the smug marrieds, you know, who would mm. go off <laughs> and suddenly they'd make quite a lot of money, and then they'd have all their children, and all they would do is talk about their children, and all they would do is turn up everywhere with their children, and people would go, you know. They'd all, in the end, have to end, hang out with each other. Mm. So you'd all have to... And I hated it when I had young kids. Yeah, it's horrible. Go and hang out with other people with young kids. I'm like, no, this is not for me. Yeah. And they're all they talk about is the kids. And I'm just like... marriage yeah. didn't last. But, you know, yeah. I, you know I, I think... I don't think it's about money so much. I think it's about just people wanting to do different things. And I also think people, when they have kids, they make everything about the kids. And it's just like... Yeah, that's like not The kid right is entering either. your life. I'm, you, are, you are going everywhere with me. You are yeah. an adult in training. You're not going to like, take right. over my life and make me go to, like, mommy playgroups. Mm. No, 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 we're going to Tesco together. Yeah, yeah. We're going where we need to uh, the go The kids together. are very demonstrative and they, want, they know what they want. Well, you know. yeah, but the thing is, if you if you make a child understand that they're integrating into your life, they actually like it. They yeah. just tend to be yeah. more proactive. They feel like they're more doing things. Well, they, they have responsibilities. Rules, yeah. yeah, they want rules. They want rules. They, 100, they want rules. A lot of new age parenting is, it's gonna. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to when these kids are like 16. Well, I think the trouble is they already <laughs> are now running the government. <laughs> These are the kids who are in there giving advice to the, to the Prime oh, Minister. Yeah. You know, about 25, Bad you know, advisors, they've been to yeah. Oxford, they think they, the sun shines out of their backside, their parents <laughs> think that as well, and they think they can run the country. They can't. Yeah. Um, speaking of running countries, North Korea, mm. I don't know if you've seen this, they've got their own TV channel launching. It's a sort of North Korean version of Netflix, right? Um, they're going to be Lord. giving out box sets, and uh, um, as you can see, it's a bit like the BBC, um, <laughs> uh, but, it's, uh, but it hasn't got any sound as of yet. I mean, my advice to them is to get somebody to operate the sound. But, um, but this is what you can see on North Korean state <laughs> TV. It's a sort of endless uh, catalogue of um, people getting in and out of very expensive North Korean cars, lots of Kim Jong-un pictures and lots of um, people clapping and also lots of military parades. I, I don't understand how anyone can take that ridiculously oversized the man seriously. Yeah, yeah, but you're not really given a choice when you're in North Korea. No, you have to take true, him seriously. Yeah. Apparently he got really fat because of the fact that he wanted to gain weight to look like his grandfather, like the father of the nation. Yeah. Yeah. And it just got out of control. And well, and also apparently um, being a bit pudgy is actually uh, quite desirable in North Korea oh, well, because they're mostly starving. Well, it probably yeah. shows that he's got wealth, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. And if you look at his daughter, who's only nine, she's also quite chunky. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know. So he's passing on his bad habits. It's, it's a status symbol. Yeah. And he loves cheeseburgers, apparently. Yeah, well, and lobster. He used to apparently import lobster a lot. 
Yeah. Which is weird because... Sylvester Stallone movie. North Korea has a, a <laughs> boat why. coastline. They can get lobster. I mean, yeah. sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, but you don't know what the sea's like in North uh, Korea, do you? True. It could be a bit radioactive. Choppy, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's talk about Danny Dyer. Um, let's have a look, first of all, at Danny Dyer in his natural habitat. This is him. I'm Danny Dyer. Bare knuckle boxers, gangsters, drug dealers. Not people. Not dangerous people here and all. So I've had butt, I flick him in the yeah. eye, boom, catch you here like this. <laughs> this man oozes man. He's a man's man. All right, sweetheart. You all right, girl, yeah? You all right? What do you want to drink? She's been lying you to disgust you. Disgust me. Please, no! <laughs> And that's our world. That's living dangerously. Sweet as. Now, I don't know whether he's a real hard man or just a sort of pretend hard man, but he's got a new project with Channel 4, mm. believe it or not. Uh, he's going to do an exploration of modern masculinity. Because he's Danny Dyer. Because he's Danny Dyer. Yeah, <laughs> Toxic masculinity, presumably, because he's Danny Dyer. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like. I'm not a fan of Danny Dyer's, but I don't particularly not what? like him. I just don't particularly think giving people like him anything other than what he normally does to do is a good idea. Well, the thing is, I don't think it's going to be, uh, and I'm trying to find a polite way to say that it's very intellectually stimulating. Because it's Danny Dyer, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but also, I, I, he, in, the, in, the, in the kind of series he's doing, he talks about British masculinity. Yes. And I'm like, surely that's just masculinity. Right. What makes yeah. British men different from, like, French men or... Well, American? I suppose you would say that, diff yeah, there is, there are probably different traits, aren't they? Well, I mean, because the thing is... I mean, is, my daughter more, tells me British men are a particularly a different breed from American men, for example. Yeah, they're not as loud and forward. No, but, I mean, well, she can give you the whole chapter in verse. I'm not going to speak for her, but, you know, she finds them very different, is all I would say. Mm, yeah. There seems to be, like, an endless slew of these documentaries now, though, where yeah. it's about, like, masculinity and crisis, what's going on. Right. And I get that there are certain issues that aren't talked about too much, there's a lot of, kind of irritating kind of feminist commentary about how all men are terrible whatever. Right. But I think it's kind of become That's like kind a... kind of passe now, isn't it? Exactly. Though? And it's becoming a bit like just... trying to do feminism, but for men. Like, yeah. men have got all these really exactly. specific men need problems. Men to talk yeah. about their problems. And it's just... Yeah, I, I was listening to him men not sure the other day. Oh, I know. I was listening to that bloke from Top Gear, you know, the one that crashed. Mm. Um, <laughs> and he's now... He's doing... got a fair few problems. <clears throat> yeah, well, he has. Yeah. But he's now doing a podcast with some guy about mental health and how. Oh you know, my god! You know, it's real, and he was saying he was being interviewed on a, one of the BBC radio stations, and I was on Saturday morning. I was just going, for God's sake! And he was going, "It's so great now that we can talk about these things." And I'm like, "No, no it's not. not. It's not actually great. I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to listen and to it. I'm not interested of people in your not talking about this. male problems. You know, <laughs> yeah. sort yourself you out." Diary of a CEO with um, is it Stephen Bartlett? He yeah. had, I kid you not, he had Terry on read that on on his podcast, and he had this man cry about his feelings, and I almost wanted to call the police because <laughs> it is criminal. It is criminal to have a legend like Thierry Henry onto your show for him to talk not about his success or how he made it, like, his feelings and how sad he was. This obsession with men talking about their feelings by other men who don't understand. Men don't need to talk about their feelings. No. Men need to find something it's to do and make money. That's yeah. it. That's what I they mean, if you want to talk you... about your feelings, you talk to your mates about them. You don't make yeah. a podcast, yeah. you know, or you talk Crying. to your wife, it's or you talk original. to your girlfriend, or you talk to your boyfriend. Whatever you do, you don't make it public, it's, do you? It's really not original. Yeah. It's and it's boring. So that's what Harry boring. said, talking about your feelings. Yeah. 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 How do you feel? My it's just people... It's essentially people being very narcissistic. Yes. Mm. Like, and I think that's un-British, you see. When you is, talk about British yeah. men, I don't think British men... Generally, proper British men, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. uh, <laughs> don't talk about their feelings with people they don't know. Yeah. Like, no right? one's stopping you getting a journal about it. There's nothing or going to therapy. It. I'm not repressed or anything, you know. Talk about oh, your maybe feelings. Maybe a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually not. Yeah, you can have some money as well, Tom, for, for laughing. <laughs> um, how about this, right? There's two tourist yeah. stories today. One is in the Venice of the Cotswolds, mm -hmm. um, which is known as um, Burton on the Water, which is terribly overcrowded. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they're talking about banning coaches. And now the businesses are going, hang on a minute. You ban the coaches, there won't be any money and there won't be any people. And then there's another story down in Malaga where apparently signs have started to appear that the, the local Spanish are very pissed off, for want of a better word, um, because loads of Brits are coming to stay in Airbnbs and they're all being kicked out of their flats, which I can sort of see is more of a problem. Same as Barcelona. Yes, yeah. is that right? Yeah, there's like quite a young, because it's quite a young city, yeah. there's huge... Um, Vast amounts of uh, protests on walls, stickers and yeah, they've got graffiti saying which tourists go the word home. Puta, which I know I can say because it's in Spanish, um, but it's effectively go home. 
mm. you know, you swine, or was that? Yeah, actually? because it's Airbnb and it right. is a harming. Airbnb, Airbnb, I think, has been a real bane on society. Yeah, it has. Yeah. And friend. you know what? I've got a lot of sympathy for it. Right. To be I honest, don't. I was never a big fan of it because I, I think there's a lot of safety in oh. like hotels. I don't, there I don't is. like the idea of just gigging out in someone's flat. You see, yes. like, use condoms behind the bed. I'm like, ugh. Ah. Well, do you know, well, there was a, a story, I think, today that came out that said oh, that if God. you are running an Airbnb and you're renting out to people, you're not allowed to have cameras in it. And you're going, sorry. What, were they, what, were so, they before? So people were filming you if you were actually, you know, renting That's Airbnb. a new rule that is very terrible. Is that, <laughs> yeah, they were finding them in bathrooms and bedrooms in America. Yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing. Well, at least give them a cut since you're making yeah. that much porn. Yeah. Yeah. Where is my fee? I know. And that, that's <laughs> the thing. At least a discount. Exactly. You know, that'd be, that's that. the thing. It was always meant to be a cheaper option. I remember when Airbnb propped up, it really was like £30 a night. And you right. thought, yeah. this is amazing. But now you pay as much as a hotel, but you get a chore list. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is mad. Now, just before we go at the break and before we look at some papers, I want to show you this, yeah, particularly for, for you two. I'm going to say ladies because it's Cheltenham Ladies' Day. Mm -hmm. um, what about this? This is the latest pillow scarf, okay. um, which has been made by somebody called Phoebe Philo, oh, right. who apparently is one of the most famous new designers out there. Mm -hmm. Did you know? I've have you heard of, heard of her? I've heard of her. Thank, no. thank um, the Lord. Apparently, um, it's going to be something that is going to be the big thing for the autumn. I mean, it looks like a hay fever covering. It does, doesn't it? It's like an airbag. Do you know yeah. how much it costs? Like, 1,400 quid. Yeah, that doesn't surprise Great me. Great British 1,400 pounds. You're getting quite a lot of scarf for your money, to be fair. You are. I imagine that's got... I can imagine you sitting on a plane next to me. <laughs> I've got... I brought my pillow with me, you know. It's like, like Masks like mask 2.0. I wish this is what Masks looked like, because at least they look comfy. Yeah. Maybe, you just pull it up yeah. a bit, maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We're taking a look at tomorrow's papers, and Cheltenham races have gone woke. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Woke. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to laugh, or perhaps cry, at the latest outbreak of wokeism in our increasingly crazy world. This time, it's hitting the world of sport. Horse racing, to be precise, and the Cheltenham Festival, to be even more precise. Cheltenham Week is an extraordinary event which takes place in the first few days of spring and brings joy to millions of people the world over. The Guinness tents alone are a thing of wonder, though no doubt they'll be selling plenty of pints of the alcohol-free version this year. The target this time, though, isn't people who like a drink, Neither is it the horses themselves that animal rights nutters are always trying to stop. And it isn't even a course invasion from the Just Stop Oil Wallies either. No, this time it's the organisers themselves who have decided to kipper their own event. Today, Wednesday, is the second day of the festival and is traditionally called Ladies' Day. It's called that because every major horse racing meeting has had a Ladies' Day ever since Queen Victoria wore a headpiece that shielded her face from the public gaze at Ascot Racecourse in the 1830s. It actually started before that, and it was celebrated in the 1700s when Royal Ascot held its first meeting. But make no mistake, the eradication of Ladies' Day this year has nothing to do with the fear of misogyny, sexism or inequality. No, no. This is all about being gender neutral. Because after all, lots of people who want to call themselves ladies actually aren't. Believe it or not, they have turned their backs on the celebration of women and their fashions on the day in order to rebrand it as Style Wednesday. As usual, the change of language means absolutely nothing. Style Wednesday doesn't describe what they're doing at all. Our own Nadine Dorries, a keen racegoer herself, is not impressed. She said, I'm assuming this is some sort of woke nod from the jockey club to the powerful trans lobby. If that's the case, the jockey club might like to consider who exactly will be attending and who it is they are now offending. And despite this fast horse's slow fashion rebrand designed to encourage people to wear more sustainable clothes, Cheltenham today was filled with the usual mix of the well-to-do, some minor and major royals, and some women who quite like dressing up for the occasion. So it looks like the wokest dream has fallen rather flat. Next year, look out for mayors who identify as stallions and a complete eradication of separate toilets for males and females. Bad luck, Cheltenham. Looks like you've won the race to the bottom. The World of Woke. Welcome back. Uh, the panel are still here. Have any, any of you ever been to any racing? No, I enjoy Cheltenham. It I was supposed a, to go um, yesterday. It but, is a thing of great... Uh, uh, it's, it's a long way to go, but it's yeah. worth going. It's it? worth going. I, I love dressing up. It's, I actually love kind of the whole... Um, the theatrics of it, if you want to put it that way. I feel like this thing that they're doing is going to turn into the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. They just have people dressing in outrageous uh, costumes now because they're like, it's fashion day or whatever they call it. And so right. it's going to come with a pineapple. It's just fun, isn't it? I mean, it's a shame that the <laughs> yeah, people just want to take the fun out of everything. Style yeah. Wednesday. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Well, I think that the doesn't problem mean is they anything. can't agree on who's a lady now. So you right. see like a lady, like six foot, six foot two, with like hairy legs and yeah. large arms and like, you know, an Adam's apple, like right. lady. Right. Are you sure? They, I don't think they've tried that yet. But I'm sure it will be next. Anyway, let's have a look at what's going on in the papers. Front page of the Metro, shame of you, uh, which I had to read the story to get the headline because I didn't realise <laughs> uh, there was a song that said something rather similar. Um, but apparently there's a massive, massive ticket-touting family, mm. which has always been the case, but this one has been making an absolute fortune. Six and a half million quid these people have been making by selling. The thing that I find amazing now is how much people pay without going to Tout. It's you insane. know, if you go to, to see Taylor Swift, 200 quid, you go Which to see... Which I do not understand. You could give me free tickets and I'd never go and see that one. No, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, and I know I, you could do this all the time, but, I mean, when I was much younger and used to go to a lot of rock concerts, you know, it was 20 quid, it was 30 quid, mm -hmm. it was maybe 50 quid, but it wasn't 200. Yeah. No, it's crazy. Yeah. And even, like, with the Taylor Swift thing, people having to queue overnight yeah. for days and yeah. days and days to get a chance to pay through the nose for a yeah. like, Flying to really Sweden. Out. These are people, yeah. by the way, who were going to the show and wearing nappies so they don't have to go to the toilet. Something's what? gone horribly yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Or pads. Yeah. yeah, no, sanitary. To, I kid you not. Yeah, flying to, no, they are. flying to obscure countries just to get those tickets. And the show's quite long, apparently. It's a tough couple of hours, so they don't want yeah. to miss anything. So, I mean... That's ridiculous. Yeah. At what cost? To see Taylor Swift. I know. Well, obviously, I, for, I would but go, also for Ed Sheeran. I would pay a lot, but I didn't want to be around that many Swifties. Please yeah. don't come for me because you're dangerous. When to be you're honest, well, if, if well, I here, like Taylor Swift... Well, here you go. These, are, these people were also <laughs> selling tickets not only to Ed Sheeran, but to Lady Gaga, Little Mix and various others, and then reselling them onto platforms like Via Gogo. Mm -hmm. This is a problem, though, because apparently these reselling sites are meant to be legit. Yeah. And they say mm -hmm. they're legit. 
but they're not, are they? No. Yeah. And it's like, because it makes you nostalgic for the days of the kind of just the tickets outstanding yeah. outside the venue, you know, trying to charge you some exorbitant price. Because now it can become like a whole industry. Yeah. You're running yeah. all these different... I once sold tickets to, because I was a big Who fan in the day, back in the day, and I did a concert, what's now Hammersmith um, Apollo, Hammersmith Odeon, and I got some better tickets. So I had two tickets to sell to this town outside. And uh, I said, and I think they were eight quid each or something, and he said, I'll give you a pony. And I didn't know what a pony was. And I went, that's no, not enough. And he went, 27. I went, fine. And that was it, because apparently a pony was 25 quid. And as soon as I, he gave me the money and he, I gave him the tickets, he got arrested. It's <laughs> 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 my only ticket tout story. Um, Michael Gove on the front, on the page eight of The Sun, right. a new definition of extremism will see Whitehall banned from engaging with hate mongers. That's going to be interesting. No, exactly. How do you define a hate monger? Well, this is, no, this is the problem. Is it a Tory well. donor? I mean, this is another thing that really annoys me with, the, with our politics now. We, like, there's crime and there's a hate crime. And what makes a crime a hate crime? Right. Surely it's not motivated by love and no. hugs and kisses. Right. So, and, and it's not hate speech. What is the difference between uh, what hate speech and love speech? It's just they can't it's tell, just can they? Not nice speech. Because the police have had a problem with this in the past, where yeah. they were going around to people's houses, knocking on doors, saying, "You've been engaging in hate speech on Twitter," and then they couldn't prove that it was hate speech. And so I'm afraid. That was the end of that. Well, I mean, yeah. India Willoughby was the latest, wasn't she? Trying well, to say that J.K. Rowling was engaged in hate speech, trying to, get she, yeah, she, to arrest her. She must have like, seen her Adam's no. apple. But this is why you can't let anyone decide what hate means, what extremism means, because someone's got to make that decision. Yeah. Um, and also, and if you it's any... different classes of crime. Like, yeah. if, 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 it's a, if it's a burglary, you could have it a hate burglary because the person <laughs> that was attacked was, yeah. I don't know, one-eyed, like, the Muslim with, 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 I don't know, that was identified as trans. Right. It's ludicrous. It's just a crime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, according to this in The Sun, a Cage, which is an organisation which is pro-jihadi, and MEND, which is was slightly less controversial. MEND, I believe, is one of the groups that actually formed the definition of Islamophobia, which has been adopted by political parties. So if they're going to say they're extremists, Mm. then presumably those who say yeah. Islamophobia is a thing are also extremists. I think men do, have got a history of kind of associating with certain groups or praising certain individuals. Yeah. It's one of those groups that kind of the government, for whatever reason, it's a bit like the Muslim Council of Britain. But they invite them in, don't they? This is it, because a lot of this comes down with the fact that a lot of these groups are, are getting state funds by yeah. various different means because they're on some sort of advisory council right. for the Metropolitan Police or because I think the Muslim Council of Britain get a lot of money via like the Kickstart scheme or something like this. Yes. And yet, so the government tries to come up with these neat ways of just cutting ties. You think just cut ties with these groups. You don't yeah, need to just, make this yeah. definition right. clamp down on all kinds you of people. You don't have to make them illegal, can of worms, you? You know. I mean, you can make certain organisations illegal. And we've all been shouting recently about the police just arresting those. It's not, the pro for me, it's not protesting. Um, pro-Palestine marches, but just arrest, uh, arrest the ones that are screaming jihad. Right. But they weren't. So, and I don't know why the government heard that. We were all saying that and said, OK, we'll redefine extremism. Yeah. It's like, no, you're not listening. It's the usual yeah. sledgehammer. You're not listening, nuts, it? yeah. It's like, you know, we don't know who stole from you, so we're going to arrest everybody in the street. Yeah. Mm. Because they, one of them's done it, you yeah, know. exactly. It's it has like to be the, one of them. old yeah. sort of, you know, I'm Spartacus nonsense, isn't it? Well, um, we've come to the end of the show, I'm afraid. Wow, that was great. And I didn't get much. any money. You didn't get any money, look, that's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give out, this is going to be a new thing, I'm going to give out more money. Megan de definitely deserves it. You've already had yours, <laughs> and so have you. Yeah. Um, come back for some more next time. <laughs> that's all from me tonight, though. You've been watching The Independent Republic, Mike Graham. Thank you very much to the great guests that I had and the panel. I'll see you all tomorrow at 8pm. It's only on Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning 
he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. 